Wonderful day. What a wonderful day to do the Lord. Again, this morning we're just going to turn to Matthew 27. What a wonderful day. I just have a simple, wonderful day. Thought to do the Lord. This morning that I believe is just going to set the tone of the afternoon. Matthew 27. What a wonderful day. I just have a simple, Matthew 27, verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Until the ninth hour. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling out to Elijah. And one of them ran, got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed. And some of the bystanders gave it to him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, yelling, One of them up his ran, just yielding it, just giving up his spirit to God. And behold, the curtains of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep torn in two from top to bottom. But were asleep, the rocks were split, started walking out. They were raised, were coming out of the tombs. And his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many as a sign and a wonder when the centurion and those who were with him kept watching over Jesus. They, they saw the earthquake and what took place, and they were filled with awe. They said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were so many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, Galilee ministering to him among who were Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and Joseph, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. The simple thought I want to express this morning is it says that the veil was torn from top to bottom. Not only did he just die for your sins, not only did he yield himself unto God for you to fulfill his purpose, it says that the veil was torn from top to bottom. And this morning the simple thought is he gave you full access to him today. He walked out of the holies of holies. He said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore. He said, I want you to have access to me today. The veil is torn, so come on in. I don't care of your condition. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what they said about you. I don't care if you're not in the right position or standard, but come on in. And you'll see that those things that you think are dead, that are asleep, today they arise. Today they walk out. Today those things that you thought were once dead and gone, today they just walk out because he's shaking the earth. And today I encourage you, get out from behind those chairs. Walk into this altar and say, I'm ready to access you. I'm ready to encounter you in the holy of holy places. And those things that I thought was dead, you resurrect them. Only you can do that. No man can do that. Only you can do that. So this morning, access him. He's here. He's waiting for you. We've saw too much to know any different. He's waiting for you this morning. And he's going to resurrect some things. He's going to shake some things up for you this morning. So come and encounter him. Come and encounter him.
What a beautiful name. What a splendid name. What a majestic name. No one compares. No one comes close to him. No one stands beside him. He is like no other. Matchless in all of his ways. And when he comes into your life in such a dramatic way, sometimes you just can't help but to overflow. With great joy and praise and adoration to the King of glory who did for me what alcohol could never do for me. Who filled a void in my life that drugs could never do, that chemical could never do for me because it would come and leave that high would come and leave that high would come and leave and I'd have to go get more but with him he's ever present he's always here he never leaves you never forsakes you you may walk but he never does do you remember being a kid when uh, right before your parents would leave the house bring the kids together. I'm the youngest of four. Mom and dad, when they would leave, which was very rare, because they had four kids, they were trying to provide for, they never got to do anything without us, but I remember when there were times when they would slip away, they'd get us all four in the room. Y'all come to the living room. Here's what you're going to do when we're gone. Play nice, be polite to each other, which never happened. <laughs> you're going to love each other, you're going to get along, but, but they would give us instructions before they would leave. And then they would leave. We'd break the football out. They'd always say, no throwing the football in the house. Okay, go outside if you want to throw the football. Okay. My dad was a cop for 23 years. Listen, everybody else was getting their lunches packed and hugged, going out the door. I was getting frisked and, you know, pat downs, you know, what are you taking to school you boy, you moron, get back in here with that knife And uh, but, but, but I remember when they would leave me and my brother look at each other you go get it we'd throw the football all around the house, knock holes and everything knock holes in the wall, y'all remember old paneling y'all don't know nothing about that. paneling and then, then that fake cheap wallpaper that would peel i never forget, me and my my brothers and sisters were throwing football through the through the house and knocked a hole in the wall and we taped it up with with mask the, the clear tape. We were so dumb we didn't even use like we didn't go find extra wallpaper. We just used clear tape just trying to patch it. But I feel like this morning, mom and daddy's gone. We can play a little bit this morning. And that last song was powerful, but but Madison, when you sang about when he comes into the room, you know when he steps in. He's in the house always, right? You know that? He's in the house. But there are times when he'll step into the room. Like you know, I keep going back to my family, you know when daddy's home, he's in the house somewhere, but when you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing and he steps in, you don't even have to be looking, your eyes can be closed and you can smell. And that shiver whew, would hit you. And you look, and there he is. My God, I believe if we close our eyes, we could shiver and be like, oh, he's here. And it happened when we started singing. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, the three in one. And so, and so I feel like it's okay this morning. If it's okay with you, it's okay with me. Can we rewind? I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in the agenda that we have to go to the next and then the next and then that announcement and then that song and then that offering and then that thing. Can we just rewind this morning? Can we just stick the pencil in and just... Remember the tape y'all would have? Remember the... Okay, so the tape was this little square thing that you would put into a, a square device that had speakers in it and the kids were like, what is a tape? And, and so sometimes that thing wouldn't, the button wouldn't work. Yeah, I know y'all were wealthy. I wouldn't... Mm -mm. Our, our buttons on the boom box was broken and to rewind you actually had to pull the tape out this this side y'all know what I'm talking about they don't have a clue that's the millennial side and the teenagers this is the side that can connect with me we would put that pencil in 
We'd spin that thing counterclockwise. We'd get it to rewind back. Then we'd plug it and hit play. Mm, that ain't good enough. We'd hit eject. If it wasn't broken, if it wasn't broken, if it was, you just pull the tape off the side of it that kept it stuck. That was your eject. You just pull the tape back and it'd pop open. You pull the. They have no clue what I'm talking about right now. Y'all do. We're going to stick the pencil in. We're going to rewind. Right before the church was born, right before the dead came out of the tomb, so I don't know how y'all figured out how to pick back up on that song. We're going to rewind to that part. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Y'all know the song. We're going to rewind. And watch how he's here. He's in the house. But you watch. Mark 16, 20. It says, as they were sent, that the Lord confirmed his word through what? Signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. So some of us in the room, we have to see it. Okay, I know he's here, but I want to see it. I think sometimes God just wants a woman of God or a man of God to stand up and say, okay, watch. Here's, here's what he's going to do. But we're afraid to do that sometimes because we're not sure he's going to move. That's why we don't pray for healing with boldness because we're really not sure they're just going to heal. Mm. So we'll just pray a little bit. And, and in some of us will revert back to, well, if it's your will, it is his will. That's why he sent Jesus. So we're going to rewind. We're going to rewind just a moment. Can I encourage you to do something? You don't have to. You're, listen, you're a grown man, a grown woman. You're in America. It's free. But can I encourage you? Would you just step out into that aisle or step down to the front? Or, hey, step to the back. Sometimes God moves so strong in the back. When I pray during the prayer time, I go to the back. Goes, Whoa. I just feel it. It's not about feeling it, but I just I sense that if I open my eyes, whoo, I can see him. I get that shiver like he's here. Boldly, confidently, in my king and my creator. You can keep your eyes open if you want to, but you watch him step into the room in just a moment. Again, he's in the house, but watch him step into the room. And here's how you'll know. People will start weeping. Hands will start going up. People will start hitting their knees. I'm trying to prep you on what to do. I'm telling you how to look for him. You're trying to look for him to come in in bodily form. He said, I've done that. Jesus, 33 and a half years, I gave you him. Now you'll see through signs and wonders. And watch how I move on people's lives. So can we do that? Can we go back? Can we go back? Y'all come back out here. You step out. We're going to step out and you step out. Watch him come in power. Watch him come in glory. Don't be a spectator. Be a participant in this.
Come on. Praise forever to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Praise forever. Forevermore. Forevermore. Your praise will continually be on my lips. You've done so much for me. Where else would I go? Peter said, what is there to go back to? <laughs> what is there to go back to? <laughs> my God in heaven, what is there to go back to? <laughs> See, there is, a, there is a point in your walk with the Lord when it gets to the point of no return for you. There becomes a place where you don't care what they think and you don't care what they say. They didn't die for me. They didn't bleed for me. They weren't. They weren't resurrected for me. There's got to come a place in your life where you step over. And I'm at the place where I just, I love you, but I just don't care. Your opinion never did anything for me anyway. I'm sorry I love you, but it's, a, it's the goodness of God. That's why we're here. You didn't come for some guitar strings and some keys and some vocals and some preach. You didn't come for that. You came for him. You came for him. Jesus. Holy Spirit. Father. Creator of all. Loved us so much. Redeemed us and restored us. I don't care who won the loss yesterday. I was coming to church no matter what. Upsets the whole apple cart, dumps, the, all, dumps all the apples out just because your team got beat and you're in a bad mood, kicking the cat, sh- screaming and cussing at the dog. Who cares? My team wins every day. Every day. I'm a king's kid. My brothers and sisters, we win every day. We serve the victorious one, never lost a battle. Perfect in all of his ways. So I don't care. What statistics? I don't care what rankings say. I don't care who did what. In the NFL, NCAA, Major League, I don't care. Doesn't matter. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Well, as the house lights come up, look at your neighbor and say, yeah, we're at that church today. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, we found ourselves in that church today. All the days you invited your friend and you thought it was safe because Pastor wasn't here. It is not safe at all. So, greet somebody around you this morning. to be in the house this morning. Yeah. Yeah. My Lord. My Lord. There's a couple of announcements this morning before our ushers come.
is week 88 of the North Georgia Revival. Before we receive the offering, just a couple of announcements. Um, for all those who are here that say, hey, how do I become a member? How do I become a part of the work here at Christ Fellowship Church? We believe that the Lord has called me or my family of this church. What do I do to get involved? Well, we don't have church membership around here, per se. We don't have, you know, a card, really, that you fill out, move your letter, as most, some denominations will do. You have to get with your former church and get them to approve the letter. We don't do anything. We do have a Covenant Partners breakfast that we offer all of those who feel led to be a part of Christ Fellowship Church. You're not a member, you're a Covenant Partner. So when you come here and engage your family into this house, you become immediately a Covenant Partner, like for life. And so we have a, a, a breakfast that we do, and the next one's coming up December the 8th. If Cody's in the house, Cody, Jim Barge, if you're in the building, and he's in the very back, way back there. Cody, if you could wave your hands so everybody can see you. Make sure you see Cody at the end of the service. Um, December the 8th, we'll have a, our next Covenant Partners breakfast where you can um, come and, and hear what this church has to offer, what we're all about, to see if it's something you want to connect your family with and support. Our church has been in revival for the past 21 months, whatever it is now, I'm not even sure. Since February of last year, when God chose to sit down in this house, in such an unprecedented, incredible way, where there's been healings, miraculous signs and wonders, and salvations, and deliverance. I mean, he's, he's here. And so uh, t t today, tonight is week 88. We'll be baptizing in both of those pools. People will be flying in from all over the world. If they're not here already, they're coming from all over the world. And they're trusting to have an encounter with the Lord, not us, but the so we just want to host his presence well and, and you do that so another announcement very quickly is we have a be known weekend coming up for our youth ministry we want to have a we have a real quick video we'd like to roll at this time uh, just pay attention to the screens somebody we believe the Lord has sent us the most tremendous youth pastors on the planet uh, high school and middle school pastors in Chase and Bailey Ray and then Anthony and Katrina Bailey listen we, we say it all the time around here man God has really equipped us with some of the most passionate people for the Lord they love God they love teenagers so get your youth involved be known weekend take advantage of that give this morning the Bible says in Genesis 12 that Abraham came and he brought first fruits to the Lord he brought an offering to Melchizedek and he brought an offering to him the Bible says he brought a tenth of what the Lord had blessed him with it's in Genesis 12 the Bible says he gave 10% a tenth of everything the Lord brought into his life. And I, I know I've heard it preached a thousand times. I know you have too. And I've even preached it this way. That, that God will open up the windows. When you give, God will give back to you. And I, and, and I still believe that. But I think sometimes we get that out of line. And that's the only reason. And that becomes the intent of our gift. Of, of the tithe. Is because we just do that. Not really in obedience. But we do it in great expectation. That God's going to bless all my 90%. And he will do that. 
But the Bible says Abraham brought, or Abram at the time brought to the Lord a tenth of everything that he, that he had come into him. And I just wanted to su- submit to you this morning that Abram did not give to provoke the Lord for more blessings. He did it in response to the Lord's blessings. Many times I feel like we come to the house and we say, okay, I'm giving you this. I'm releasing what's in my hand, but you better release what's in yours. And I feel like the Lord, He he graces us in that. He's like, bless them, darling heart, okay. But don't you know the Lord's going, hey, why don't you come to me because it's what I've done in your life, not because what you're expecting from me. You're, You're asking for more, and I just want you to be glad in what you have. Come on. It, it, it's, it's not that Abram gave to invoke the blessing of God on his life. He gave in response to the blessing. And so this morning as we give, and I know many of you have already, you've already set in your mind and in your heart, and you're, I'm, I'm giving this or I'm not giving anything or I'm whatever. But I'll just challenge you to just take a moment. Just take a moment and just remember what he's done for you and how he's blessed you. And then begin to give out of that. Lord, not what you're going to give, but what you've already given. I'm grateful for this. And that's the intent of my heart. Not to release the open heaven, which you desire to do for me and my family. But I'm grateful for where you've brought us out of. What you've given us so far, so I gladly bring it. Can can we stand as we give this morning? We always stand when dignitaries and rulers of the land walk in the room well how about we stand when the king walks in the room Lord as we give today it is out of a grateful heart with gratitude you've been so good to us that's how we come this morning Lord not asking you to do anything else we know you would but we're not asking for that According to Abram and the way he gave, we give in response to what you've already done. We honor you today through our giving in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, Amen. Worship as you give this morning. Just a quick update as you give. Um, the majority of the team is already in Seoul, Korea. They are already ministering there, they are already baptizing there. Come on, somebody. They are halfway around the world carrying the North Georgia revival into Seoul, Korea. Pastor Todd has sent us a couple of uh, pictures. We'll throw those on the screen. You know how Pastor Todd is at 6 this morning. He's blowing my phone up with pictures. You know, it's 13 hours ahead. So 6 6 a.m. to us, you know, it's 7 uh, 7 p.m. over there. So they're in the middle of service. So look at this precious lady getting baptized. There's Andy and Miss Sandy and Joanne. Look at that. Miss Sherry doing what she does. Pastor Karen in the water. Is that Abby right there? Look at that. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Look how much power and expectation. I guess they baptize all the women because I don't see nothing but men right there. <laughs> Look at that. All the women are raptured and gone, I guess. I, I know. What about that? Listen, Chase and I were talking this morning, and he said something that was so profound and prophetic, I believe. He said, Marty, can, I, can you imagine this? They are halfway around the world in Seoul, Korea, doing what we do here. Tonight, we'll be doing the same thing. And God is touching his people in Seoul, Korea, just like he is here. It, you don't understand the churches we're going to know, going to over there are predominantly Presbyterian churches. They've requested that we sprinkle or use a towel. And we're like, uh, that's cute, but God's got a better plan. Full immersion. And so, so God is touching his people, but Chase said something. He said, think about this. They're halfway around the world in Seoul, Korea. Right? 13 hours ahead. 
You ever seen that? Has anybody been to the coming fair or any fair where you see that? I think it's like a pirate ship or something. That it'll start swaying and then it goes up about halfway and it loses its potential and power. And the RPM slow down and it kind of goes and stops and then goes back. Chase said, imagine this. The power of God that's here has now began to shift all over Alabama, Florida, New Jersey, Texas. And it's just swinging. In February of next year, we'll be in Anaheim, California. In December, second and third, I'll be in, I'll be in Nebraska preaching and baptizing there. Maybe someday we'll be in New York City, on the street in New York City. And that thing's just swinging. And Chase is like, here they are halfway around the world. And when it should have stopped and lost its power, it creates an RPM. It creates a... And then it's back to us tonight. Then tomorrow morning it's back to them. Well, it could be, could be tomorrow morning for us too. But it's around the clock now. It's 24-7 water baptisms all over the globe. Chase, that was, that was profound, but I believe it was prophetic. That there is coming a day when every tribe and every tongue will experience and encounter this great move of God that we're enjoying right here. I believe it. Okay. You're ready to move on, I can tell. Anything else? I'm missing announcements or anything? Y'all know I'm not the professional. I don't normally do this stuff. Announcements are good. Nope, we're not. Yep. One announcement? It's what happens when he steps into the room. We, we just forget things. We love you, Miss Donna. We thank God for the food bank. Miss Helen, all the team. So honored. Thursday, you fed how many people? 110 families. 110 families being blessed by the food center here at Christ Fellowship Church. If you have your Bibles, go to Exodus We'll start in uh, chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14. Make sure you're back this evening, week 88, as I've already said, week 88 of the North Georgia Revival. Pastor David Edmondson from Covenant Connections Church will be preaching tonight. You can never tell what's going to happen when that man preaches. You'll, you think you got it figured out and, and the Lord will allow him to turn it. And it'll be like, I always say it. I've said this for probably, what, I think we've known him for 20 years now, you know, in full-time ministry. I've always said this. I feel like his office has that red phone. Y'all, they still don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Y'all do. The millennials over there are like, I don't understand tapes, cassette tapes. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't understand the red phone. The red phone, y'all remember the red phone? You could pick up, get that direct line to Batman. I feel like Pastor David's got that red light, that, that red phone to heaven, and God shows him things he doesn't show anybody else on the planet. And he'll preach something, you, and you're like, yeah, I got this one figured out. And by the time you're done, you're just sitting there. I've always said, greatest preacher, greatest preacher I've ever heard. I could, I'd put him with, with, I won't name names, but the ones on TBN and Daystar and God TV and all that. Sometimes I watch them and I think, why is Pastor David Edmondson not on all of those channels multiple times? I've always thought, why is that? He is one of them, and I've said it. Even when, y'all know the story, even when we were going through our stuff for six years, I never stopped saying, that man can preach the paint off the walls in the building. My goodness. Don't y'all agree? He'll be here tonight. Exodus chapter 14. It is so funny. Standing here, you can tell what wave to ride because you're with me. And then when you people are not with us anymore, y'all shut it off. And you're like, okay, it's time to move on. I can go and go. And then when I can tell, mm -mm, nope, next thing. Because <laughs> you're like, mm. Exodus 14. Look at verse 10. I'm going to read out of the New King James. You can read out of whatever version you have. What's the best version? The one you have in your hand. Exodus 14, verse 10. 
And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? In other words, the graves were all full over there in Egypt. So did you bring us out to find new graves for us here? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Didn't we tell you the same thing in Egypt that we're telling you right now? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve those Egyptians than we should die here in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Mm. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? This is the Lord speaking to Moses now. Why do you cry to me? Why are you crying to me, Moses? Didn't I already tell you what to do? Didn't I give you specific orders? Didn't I give you a vision and a dream to, to, to deliver my people? Didn't I tell you what to do? Why are you crying out to me? <laughs> Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Say go forward. But lift up your rod. Say lift up. And stretch out your hand. Say stretch out. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Let me set this scenario up for you. So here's the children of Israel, Moses. God has given Moses this vision and this dream within his heart. I'm going to be used of the Lord to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, into the promised land. Woo, that's shouting stuff right there. We're going to go to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. My Lord. Chocolate milk, I hope. That's the scenario. And so they realize the Egyptians and Pharaoh are coming after them. They, they know the dream. Moses has shared the dream. God's going to deliver us out of their hands and out of their bondage. And he's going to deliver us into our promised land, and that's going to be our home for eternity. We're going to be blessed and highly favored and all this other stuff. But the Egyptians are getting closer and closer, and so the people turn and see the Egyptians. See, the problem is always looking back. So they got upset. And they look at Moses. D didn't we tell you in Egypt to leave us alone? Why are you bringing us up? into this promised land that evidently you can see. We had not seen nothing. See, God sometimes will give you a dream and let you see something nobody else can see. Because when he's called you to lead, he'll always give you the dream and the vision. When God gives you a vision to do something, he'll always give you the provision to make it happen. You just got to stay true to the course. So the, so the children of Israel are like, uh, but, but look who's behind us. Moses is like, but look who's in front of us. But look who's behind us. But look who's leading us. Could it be that Moses didn't do a great job of sharing the dream with them? He didn't do a great job of communicating the dream to them because they couldn't see what he saw. As leaders, men and women, it's our job to release what we see so that the others can see and come up and come out with us. But if we don't communicate what we see and what God's doing, then we'll always go back to Egypt and say it was much better here. Moses, just leave us here. We told you, leave us alone. Why would you bring us up and out just to kill us? So they're going to kill us here in the wilderness. They said, I would rather be a slave to the Egyptians than to die here chasing God. That's what they were saying. I would rather die being a slave and being in bondage then to stepping out into the unknown and to dream along with you. You know that's why many people today don't have dreams. Because it scares them too bad. It's easier just to make my paycheck. And go home and watch the Braves get beat. And Georgia get beat. And everybody get beat that we love. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's getting beat. But we still win. 
but, but that's, the, that's the thing. We'd rather, just, we'd rather just stay here. Moses, what are you doing? And Moses goes to the Lord. And the Lord says, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Why are you coming to me crying to me? And Moses said, well, because they're crying to me. They're crying to me, so I'm crying to you. And the Lord says, stop crying to me. You tell them to stop crying. Get back. Watch what I do. See the salvation of the Lord. He's, telling, he's trying to tell the children, hey, we're going to be okay. We're going to make it. Y'all calm down. No, we wanted to stay there and, and serve them, then die out here. This is the same group of people in Exodus, I believe it was 3, that said, oh, God, deliver us from these Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Deliver us. They cried out for that. They wanted that. Send us somebody to lead us. And God said, okay, Moses. And now, just 11 chapters later, they're saying, <laughs> just kidding. We really don't want you to deliver us. We would rather serve the enemy. I'd rather just be in bondage than to come out here into the unknown and risk death. God's trying to give them life and all they can see is death. Moses had a dream. Moses had something on the inside of him because he had an encounter with God. And he became consumed. And the burning bush began to burn on the inside of him. With a dream, with passion to lead the people out. It began to burn on the inside of Moses. This is my call, this is my mandate, this is my mission. It began to burn on the inside of him. He had a dream. But sometimes the very people you're trying to lead in your dream are the very ones who will fight you in your dream. I remember being, being, a, being a young boy. My dreams were stupid. <laughs> my dreams were dumb. I remember being a boy in 1980. And, I, and my dream was, at that time, I told all my friends around the neighborhood, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be Herschel Walker and I'm going to play for the Georgia Bulldogs. Then w- once I set records there, I'm going to go play for the Dallas Cowboys. That was my dream. We have a little game on the trampoline. Y'all ever have trampolines? Can't have them anymore because everybody's getting broke and busted. You know what's funny? The stuff we played with made us stronger. It makes them weaker. I don't understand. They're all fragile and stuff today. It made us better, stronger, more durable. Come on, somebody. That's what the old people should be shouting. Hey, that's me. Older, sorry. No. Put them on the trampoline. They'll be fine. We used to play on the trampoline, and it'd be, it'd be a man and a football. Uh, uh, a man. <laughs> that's a stretch. It'd be a kid, about 80 pounds, in a, in a football. And it'd be six of my friends on, 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 like, down like linemen on the trampoline. And your job was to get to the end of the trampoline and touch the bar. You know, you got the, tra- the mat, then the springs, and then the bar. You had to touch the bar. That was the touchdown. If you touch the bar with the football in your hand, that's, you scored a Herschel. That's the game. It's called Herschel. That's what we call it. My dream was to become Herschel. I took that game serious. Every Sunday morning, I'd go find my little red shirt. I didn't care if I had Levi. I didn't care if I had Puma. I didn't care if I had Adidas or... I didn't care what logo was on it as long as it was red. I, I could, we couldn't afford Georgia Bulldog stuff. It's too expensive. <laughs> if you didn't have red, you'd dip it in some Kool-Aid, a little white T-shirt, tank top. You'd dip it in Kool-Aid, make it red, and then take it like it was your jersey. We'd tape numbers on the back of our tank tops. I was Herschel. I was 34. Come hell or high water, you will not tackle me. I'm getting to the end. I'll put a knee in your nose. I'll do whatever I have to do. I'm getting to that end because I'm Herschel. I was taking it serious. My dream was to be a Georgia Bulldog and play for the Georgia Bulldogs. Well, that didn't work out. That didn't work out at all because then you hit, you know, junior high football. The guys are a little bigger and a little stronger. They hit hard. Then you make it to high school, 10th grade. I'm playing against, you know, this team called Buford. What D1 college are they from? I'll never forget, we're on the 10-yard line, and they handed this boy, and he comes running through the line, and I'm thinking, hey, hey, Herschel, I'm dreaming about playing football for the rest of my life. And I went to hit this kid. This kid was not a kid. This kid was a grown man. <laughs> he hit me, stepped over me, his cleat all over my face, and pushed. I mean, my helmet flying off, almost threw up. Life flashed before my eyes. Saw birds and stuff flying around, Tweety Birds. It was then and, and right then I realized, Mm-mm, I will not play for the Bulldogs. I will not be. That is not my dream. I'm done. I quit. That was the last game I ever played. I quit. It was a spring game. Tenth grade year. I said, bye. Out. 
That dream changed. Why? Because I was discouraged. Then I had a dream in, in, in high school. Wrote it down. Me and my wife were looking through some old books my senior year. You know, you get a little book that says, here's my dreams. Here's what I want to be when I grow up. You know what my dream was? Take a stab at what my dream was in 1988, my senior year. Fashion designer. <laughs> fashion, fashion designer. Christy, my sister's here. It was fashion designer. <laughs> wow. What an idiot. Of all the things I could dream of. Fashion designer. That didn't make it. We all have dreams. And here's, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but here's how I think most of us see, see dreams. And listen, don't laugh at me because I know y'all's dreams are just as goofy as mine was. So many dreams. But I, I feel like, I feel like, it's time to dream again, number one. The Lord told me to send, send this message to you, what he's been speaking to me. I want to speak to you. I believe it's, he said it's time to dream again. But with every dream, I believe, this is the way we see it. God gives us a dream. There's the destination. When the Lord gives us a dream, immediately we should be at the destination. That's the way we see it, especially in the church. Name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. It's mine. If God said it, it's done today, right now. I want it. It's mine. God's, here's how most people dream. Let me just take the ministry. Most people in ministry feel called to ministry. After 18 years of full-time youth ministry, I've heard no less than a thousand times, I believe God's called me into the ministry. What do I do? My answer has always been the same. Run. Run. If you can do anything else besides ministry, go do it. I, I'll tell you, I'm as serious today as I was back then. If you can do anything else besides ministry, run. Run. Go do it. But if you can't see yourself doing anything but ministry, run to it. What I'm saying is if there's anything else in your life that you think, mm, I might want to dabble in, I might want to get over there and you know, and I'm not saying you can't do multiple things. I'm just saying if your heart is not bent on serving him and the ministry for the rest of your life, then you better run and, and, and pursue fashion design or plan for the Bulldogs. Uh, but, this, but this is the way we see it. God, you spoke it to me and let it be so right now. Men and women say, well, God's called me to the ministry. What's my next step? Spend time with him. Pray, seek his face, find yourself a good place where you can study the word of God. Kaneo would be a great place here. Find yourself a place where you can study to show yourself approved so that when you do stand in front of the people, you, it's not that you don't have something to say, it's the word of God that comes forth and not your opinion and not your reflections or anything like that. But this is the way we see it, dream to destination. But that's not exactly how it works in the kingdom because in the kingdom... I don't know if you can see that very well, but discouragement comes. I'll never forget, 1998, felt like the Lord had called me into a, a, a full-time ministry, but just trying to pursue what we're supposed to do at the next level, and went to spend three years in, in Bible college there in Gainesville, the Rock Ministry Training Center. Three years, we studied under the, under the word of Pastor Karen, Pastor Todd, the direction of those two, and Dr. Edward Kuhn, who was there. Pastor Robin Martin, who has now gone on to be with the Lord. But these great men and women would teach us, teach us every, I was going to Bible college Tuesday and Thursday nights. Two to two and a half hours every Tuesday and every Thursday night for years. Because I was trying to expedite the, uh, uh, the, you know, the call. We knew that we were going to be sent out at some point. I said, you know, Pastor, you can't send me out not knowing this thing. And so I'll go every Tuesday and every Thursday night. Study, but I'll, I'll never forget in 1998 we we're going to launch a, a, a business. My wife and I really felt we were supposed to launch a business, and I was stepping out of, away from a job that was paying me great money, company truck, all, the gas. You know, I, I never had to pay for gas. The company paid for the gas, the company truck, uh, great income, 
um, just had it made. But I felt the Lord say, start that business. Start that business. Never started a business in my life. And, and, and stepped out in faith with the dream that God's going to allow us to, to, to not just have a great business and income, but to be a blessing to the kingdom. That's always been our heart. We want to be a, a blessing to the kingdom. I just don't want to make money so I can say I've got big homes and big cars and all that fun stuff. You can have big cars and you know, big fancy homes and all that stuff as long as that stuff doesn't have you. That's the difference. And so we just want to be a blessing. So we launched out to start this business. And my income, y'all, it, it went total you know, from, from a, a, a good amount, uh, uh, no, a really healthy amount, when you add up everything, a very substantial amount as a young man. So I'll never forget my first paycheck with our business was $178.88 for nine months. We never changed anything other than maybe had to eat at home a little more. Hot dogs started tasting a lot better. Chili looked a lot better. Ramen noodles looked really good. Peanut butter went a long way. But we never lacked and we never hurt. But there were people that would come to us and say, you don't need to start that business. This discouragement's going to come. You don't go straight from dream to destination. See, the destination gets way smaller. When you launch out into something because God's gave you a dream, at some point discouragement hits and then the, and then the reality and the destination seems to be much smaller and, and further away than you really expected that it was going to be. Moses had a dream and he knew, I'm going, I'm, I'm going, God's using me to deliver the people out of Egypt into the promised land. But when discouragement came, that doubt came. How do you know doubt came? Because the Bible says the Lord said, why are you crying out to me? Why are you questioning me? You know doubt set in because he's like, why are you calling out? Why are you crying out to me, Moses? I've already told you about the dream and the destination. Just keep going. But discouragement came. The people are crying. The people are getting funny. They're complaining about me. They're, they're saying I'm a horrible leader. They're saying I don't have what it takes to be a business owner. That's what they would come to us and say, you don't need to start your own business. Number one, you know nothing about the business you're jumping into, which I did not. Peter didn't have to know about water to walk on it. He just had to trust the Lord. Another message for another day. He just asked you to step out. He didn't ask you to study the, the chemical balance or whatever of water. He didn't ask you to, the consistency of water. He didn't ask you anything about the science of water. He just said, step out of the boat. Come here. Peter, come. That's all he said. Trust me. Right? Well, but about the wind and the way? Just get out of the boat. Don't worry about what's going to discourage. The discouragement is going to come. Get your eyes off discouragement and just keep your eyes on the destination. Remember the dream I put in you. And then, and then if discouragement's not enough, He's going to send distractions will always come. Distractions are going to show up to get you. You know, some distractions can be, can be negative, And sometimes distractions can be the, the blessings that come into your life. You start getting focused on the money you're making. It was never about the money. It was about your heart to be a blessing, right? I've seen so many business owners in the church start off clawing, believing God for everything, Next thing you know, money starts coming in, clients start coming from everywhere, then you don't see them in church anymore. I'm like, man, you used to be at the altar weeping before God, saying, hey, here I am, use me, Lord. Now we can't find you. Now you're crying about the church using you. Well, they just wanted me for this, they wanted me for that, they just want me for my money. And No, they just asked for the same tithe that everybody else is expected. Right? That's what the Word says, not us anyway. The Lord commanded that. Hello. But the ones who used to be in the altar crying out, oh God, I, just, I, I need you to provide for my family. We just need direction on my job. And he shows up in a beautiful, powerful way. Then you got so much you don't know what to do with. But instead of being a blessing like you in, your original dream and, and intent was, now we can't find you anymore. And then you got to start blaming something. Here's the reason. Because people in public are going to say, hey, didn't you used to go to that church? Ah, oh, yeah, I had to back away, man. All they wanted me for was my, my money. My money. Had all these... Kids' events and youth events, and needed a twenty-five dollars for this and a hundred for that. They just want me for my money. I can't stay around there anymore. And the Lord said, "Isn't that what you asked me for? To be a blessing to others?" Wow. Now your money's become the distraction. The, the very thing that you've been praying for has become your distraction. And and then it's the other side. It's like God's not providing for you. It's like the it's like the well is dry, and you keep crying out and crying out and crying out. Because you're focused more on the distraction of not having anything than the king over everything. 
I don't have it, I don't have it. And the Lord said, you never will until you start chasing me. How can you prove that, Matthew? Seek first the kingdom. All these other things will be added to you. He, he didn't say seek your job, seek your career. Seek, seek, those, seek those degrees and all those letters after your name. He didn't say seek that. All those things are fine, but he said seek me first. Don't get distracted about what the world can offer you or what you don't have. I know you're not in the promised land yet, but it's still there. It hasn't moved for you. The only thing it's moving or not moving is you. The children of Israel stopped and said, Moses, they're coming after us, look. And God's saying, keep moving. Did he not say, go forward? Did he not say, go forward? Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Can we put up verse 15? I want them to see it. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. It's okay. Y'all trust me? It's there. <laughs> Exodus 14, verse 15. 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through it on dry ground. On, on dry ground. Isn't it funny that we pray for rain and complain about the mud? <laughs> let it rain, let it rain. Oh God, there's mud all over me. Right? Not any of you guys. Y'all are, are awesome. I love what he said. Verse 14. Right after he said, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Verse 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Look at somebody and say, hold your peace. Come on, look at somebody else and say, you better hold your peace. Now don't tell your neighbor, but you know what that means? That's what the Lord is saying. I will fight for you as long as you. Sometimes you better just stand there in your armor, hidden beyond the armor of God. You got the helmet on, the belt on, the breastplate on you. Sometimes you just need to be quiet and stand there so the enemy has no clue who's under that armor. <laughs> Let that sink in. That hit me last night. Imagine you're standing there in the armor and there's the enemy. If you don't say nothing, he has no idea who's behind that. He's thinking, this is the Lord. I probably shouldn't do anything here because that armor looks familiar to me. That armor come from heaven. I don't know if I should come against that because if it's, if it's the Lord underneath that, I will lose. But I don't know. If I can just get them to talk and open up, maybe they'll share some fear or maybe they'll share some distractions and then I know it. Then, I'll, then they'll reveal their true character and who they really are and then I'll pounce on them. Sometimes you just need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses looked at him and said, hey, God's going to move, but I need you to zip it. That's what he said. That's my translation. The Lord will fight for us, but you better be quiet. Don't say another word. Because if you do, doubt comes in. Discouragement comes in. You know how it is. You're in the office and everybody's blessed and highly favored and the boss is good, and money's good, and here comes Christmas. And everybody's, everybody's feeling like, man, we're going to get a bonus, a great Christmas bonus. Everything's great. Everybody's producing. And you let one person in the bunch say, well, you know what I heard? I'm just saying. <laughs> I heard, I just heard through the grapevine that um, there's going to be no Christmas bonus. And then it goes through the rumor mill. And by the time it's, it's, it's time to clock out that day, now everybody's discouraged because we're not getting a Christmas bonus. So everybody's production lowers. Don't act like you're all spiritual. I know who you are. Well, I ain't going to do it. I, I, I could do ten get gadgets today, but I'm going to do six. Is it gadgets? <laughs> I'm going to make 14 machines today. I could, but I ain't going to put six of them together. I'm going to show them. And that discouragement, and then that gets you distracted and gets you off the destination in the dream. 
None of this is in my notes. I'm just kind of giving you that as it comes, comes to me. Look at somebody and say, the Lord will fight for you. But you got to be quiet. you got to stay calm. One version says, the Lord will fight for you, but just stay calm. Another version says, the Lord himself will fight for you, just be quiet. He said, tell the children, go forward, lift up, and stretch out. You should, you should get those three things embedded in your soul and your spirit today. You should get those three things. You should repeat it over and over and over. I will go forward, I will lift up, and I will stretch out. I will go forward, I will lift up, and I will stretch out. I will go forward, I will lift up, and I will stretch out. I will go forward with the Lord. I will lift up my eyes to the heavens where my help comes from. And I will stretch out. I will stretch myself and do greater things than I ever dreamed of. I will go forward, lift up, and stretch out. Come on, say it. Whisper it. Go forward. Lift up. And stretch out. That feel good? I will go forward. I will lift up. And I will stretch out got to hurry. Moses had a dream. People started talking. Started discouraging him. Here comes the distractions. Now they're looking at the Egyptians and Pharaoh more than they're looking at the the destination. Right? Then delay sets in. So you go from dreams to discouragement to distractions and then delay. Well, it didn't happen as fast as I wanted to, so I quit. God gave me a dream, and it didn't happen when I thought it should happen, so I quit. Gave up on my dream. I had a dream. Clung to that dream for so many years. But now that I'm older, now that I don't have money, now that I don't have favor with people, and I don't have this, I don't have that, and I don't have nothing, then I just I gave up on my dream. All because of delay. Listen, Jesus did not just come out of the womb of Mary preaching and ministering and laying hands on the sick. He spent 30 years of his life preparing for a three and a half year ministry. And you won't come out preaching and prophesying and proclaiming everything and you wonder why Pastor Todd won't give me a microphone. Pastor Karen won't let me teach in Canale. No. Prove yourself. Study to show, show yourself approved. Spend some time. Stop. You're too focused on the delay. I want God to use me now. Well, hold on. I want God to use me on the stage. Well, when, when's the last time he's used you in, the, in, in, your, in your prayer closet to intercede? When, I want God to use me on platforms. I want to preach crusades, and I want to go all over the world and start orphanages. And Why don't you take care of the kid that's down the street from you? I am not trying to be mean or crude. This is the way the Lord speaks to me. Oh, God, I'd love to start an orphanage in, in Haiti. He's like, well, you know there's a daycare right up the street that has kids that can't even afford lunches. Well, why don't you start helping out there? I'm just, this is how we talk. This is how we talk. God, I just want a huge ministry. I want a traveling, healing ministry. Great, start at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, room number 204. That could be prophetic. I don't, know who's, I don't know who's in Northeast Georgia 204. Lord, touch them right now. Bring them up off their sick bed. Heal them in Jesus' name. Get them to the water. They'll get touched. Amen. That's where it's going to start for you. That's where your healing ministry starts. Northside Hospital, just walk in. Who of you are sick in this building? When you walk into the office tomorrow morning, when you walk in and clock in, Lord, who is it today that has sickness in their body? And the Lord will begin to speak to you. Not only is it sickness, their gallbladder is about to explode, and I want you to pray for them and lay hands on them. And if you got some oil, use that too, because that's James 5, and I'll partner with that. And that healing ministry starts there. But everybody wants to be Benny Hinn. Everybody wants to travel in white suits and be in front of 60 and 80,000 people. And, you know, well, great. Start at the hospital, start at the workplace, start when your baby's sick at home. Well, I don't have any oil at home. There's some Crisco. Pull a little out, a little dab will do you. Pull it out. A little dab will do you. Pull that out. Get the olive oil, pull that out. Pray over it. Lord, in this moment, this is not just vegetable oil. In this moment, we consecrate it for the work of the Lord. I am serious as I can be. You use what you got. 
He said, Moses, what's in your hand right now? Another message for another day. What's in your hand right now? Not asking you what I want to bring to your life tomorrow and next year and 10 years. What do you have in your hand that you can use right now? The widow with two sons. He didn't say, what do you believe in God for? He said, what's in your house right now? What can we start with right now? This is how it really looks. You go from dream, get you some determination. No matter what discouragement comes, you just get enough determination that says, come hell or high water, I don't care if it rains, sleets, or snows, I will be at church in the morning. I don't care who wins a football game this afternoon. I don't care who loses a football game this afternoon. I don't care if mom and them get a stomach bug and they're all sick, but I'm still good and I'm going to stay home with them. Nope, I am determined. I will be in the house of God tonight in that water, come hell or high water, at least for a little bit before we fly to Chattanooga or drive, whatever we're doing. I'm determined. I'm deter Determination will then lead to discipline. Spend your quiet time with him. Once you spend your time in private, you'll always, God will always reward you publicly for what you do in private. Not the other way around. What you do in private, God will make room for you publicly. Listen, I was preaching to little coffee shop rooms of two to three people before I ever got a microphone put in my hand. I was praying for people in, in the prison up in Alto. I'd go in there on Monday nights with Dennis Bell. Scared to death. I'd go in there and Dennis would say, okay, we're going to leave worship tonight. He'd print off the sheets. You got a keyboard? You got a guitar? He's like, no, bro, it's me and you. He said, we're going to lift up our voice and make a joyful noise. Y'all know Dennis? We're going to make a joyful noise, me and you. I'm like, you might make a joyful noise, but I'm going to make a ruckus around here when I start singing. But I'll never forget, we had those little printed sheets, and we'd walk into seven different doors, and that, that deputy would tell us behind every door, now you understand and you give me consent. When I shut this door behind you, you understand it could take me three to five minutes to get back in here if anything goes wrong. There were seven of those doors that he's behind him and has got to get through each door to get to us. And they open up this room. And here we are with about ten men playing cards and watching some, some staticky old TV. And you look around and there's no curtains. There's showers open and everybody's using them. And you're like, my God in heaven, this is real, folks. That's where I started ministry. You want a microphone? There's great acoustics in a jail cell. We would go into a jail cell with seven bunks, six, seven bunks, eight bunks. We'd go in there with these convicted, but sons. Convicted, sentenced, but still, Jesus wants them to be sons. We'd go in there scared to death, man, and they've got, they got stuff that's kind of intimidating. And here I am, a little white boy. <laughs> from Rabbit Town, Georgia. And Dennis. And he's like, hey, I don't care what y'all up in here for. Don't care. Love y'all. Jesus is going to touch y'all tonight. He's going to move in y'all tonight. Y'all ready for that? We're all like, yeah. And Dennis goes straight into song. He didn't care. This is the day. This is it. And all those guys like, this is the day? This is like day number 418 for me. We talk, this is the day. And Dennis would start singing, and the power of God had hit that room, that jail cell. So many men would be weeping. And I'd watch Dennis. He was the model for me of Marketplace Street Jail Ministry. He was the model for me. I worked with him. We'd go places in ministry. Something began to leap on the inside of me. A dream. God, someday, someday you'll let me preach. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know John 3, 16. But I know you radically saved me December 5th of 1993, and I've never been the same. And I will go where you tell me to go, and I'll do what you tell me to do, and I'll say what you tell me to say. And I'd have this dream leap on the inside of me, scared to death, college dropout because of a public speech class. I said, I ain't talking in front of anybody, and I quit, 1990. Get saved in 93 and 1997, go on a mission trip, and God said, ah, watch what I'm going to do, son. Not only will you speak on my behalf for the rest of your life, I'll send you all over the world. 
continuity. I feel like I need to say this. Y'all know when Mary got beside Elizabeth and they were pregnant? The Bible says when Mary got up against Elizabeth, the baby within Elizabeth leaped. John leaped. Some of you don't have that thing leaping on the inside of you because you're hanging out with the wrong people. Get away from the dream killers. <laughs> Cling to the dream giver. Hang out with the dream fillers. That needs to hit my notes because I didn't put that in there. That's good. That's cheesy, but it's still good. It's cheesy. Get away from the dream killers. Get close to the dream giver and then walk with the dream fillers. Those who, who fan the flame of that dream on the inside of you. Why do you think for 26, almost 27 years, we've been around and submitted to Pastor Todd and Pastor Karen Smith? Because every time I'm around them, something leaps on the inside of me. Can't explain it. Every time I get around them, something leaps. Even when I'm uncomfortable in, in, in Bogota, Colombia, and he puts a bullhorn in my face and says, now you go preach, son. And you do it because they see something in you you can't even see in yourself. The dream fillers will pull that dream out of you. This is the way it looks. Dreams, it's going to take determination, some discipline, and then desperation. I am so hungry for God more right now than I was 18, 19 years ago. I'm more hungry for God right now than I was in December of 1993 when I first met Him. I'm desperate for Him. I'm hungry for Him more than I've ever been in my life. It requires desperation. Then dedication. No matter what, I'm in. I'm in. When they said, you want to go to Seoul, Korea? Yeah. Don't you know about that? Don't care. What about North Korea? Don't care. What about Young Jung Kim In? Well, I don't care. I don't care who he is. You got to get your place, your, yourself in a place where the dream and the destination become so appealing that if it costs me my life, I'm in. All God's looking for is your yes before He even asks the question. Got the text. Hey, I think there may be something in Anaheim. I think these pastors are looking for you too because they've been watching on Sid Roth and they see what's going on here. They want you to come preach. And they want they want Marty to come preach. They want Pastor Todd to come preach. We want you to, to, to preach, pray, prophesy, and baptize in Anaheim, California. Yeah. My response, yes. Why? Because if God gives you the dream, if God gives you the vision, he will always give the provision. We have never lacked, not one time. Well, I wish I could do that. Well, you start in December 5th of 1993, honey, and you surrender everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, come hell or out water, I will pursue him over everything. And you, and you abandon everything. And it may cost you some friends. It, it will cost you some friends. It will cost you some friends. It will cost you financially. It will cost you. It's going to cost you. But the promised land, the end of the story goes, and y'all know, the end, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but the end of the story goes where Moses goes forward, lifts up, stretches out his hand, and the waters become walls so that they cross right on through on dry ground. And they turn back one last time, and all of the enemies are drowned. message another day that thing that you've been carrying just needs to drown that fear that you, that's been tormenting you for 37 years it just needs to drown why do you baptize more than once why did you get baptized more than once because it could yeah, but yeah but I thought it's supposed to be one time and you know that's it salvation baptism that's it I've never read that I, when you show me it's only the one time and you convince me of that that it's in the word not your opinion then, then hey I'll lean to that 
But John the Baptist, the theologians will tell you that three times daily that boy would go. Sorry. John the Baptist would go. There's rabbit town coming out of me. John the Baptist would go and immerse himself three, maybe more times per day to prepare himself for what he was doing. The brides, the groom, they would all go to their mikvah. They'd, they'd immerse themselves. Women, I, I don't want to get too, too, too graphic for you, but the women, guess how they would clean themselves and purge themselves after? Every time, that one, once a month, every time that was over, they would go immerse themselves in a mikvah to purify and cleanse themselves. Better study that. Don't go off what grandma and grandma and papa and all them told you. You better go off what the word says. They would purge themselves and cleanse themselves multiple times. I've, I've, I've tasted and seen too much to go back. That is not even a debate for me anymore. Why, why more than once? Why, why, why not once? It's not even a debate. If that's your argument, then hey, you can be baptized once and, and that's cool. That's great. All I can tell you is those who get in this water, they have such a radical encounter with the king. I can't explain it. God didn't call me to explain anything. Moses never had to explain, really, the promised land. He just said, he just had to say, trust me. Jesus never had to explain the water to Peter. Just get out of the boat. Just step out. Stand to your feet all over the room. God wants to restore some dreams again. Can I, can I tell, can I share two sentences with you and then, then I'll be done. I want to read this to you. This blew my mind. Forbes magazine says that 78% of every worker in the United States of America, 78% live paycheck to paycheck. Don't raise your hand. Think yourself. Do I live my life daily paycheck to paycheck? Most of us have more month than we do money got more bills than we got what's in our bank account it's paycheck to paycheck more workers 78% but yet we serve Jehovah Jireh my provider the sickness and disease that is rampant across America but yet we serve the Lord who heals You ever heard this? Another day, another dollar. Another day, another dollar. I'm just trying to make my ends meet. I'm just barely getting by. How are you today? Oh, I'm making. to get you up out of bed every morning, no matter what you get paid passion purpose a dream a dream a God given dream that God could use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise somebody just needs to get a dream somebody's had a dream somebody was given a dream a long time ago but you almost gave up on your dream it's time to get your dream back. It's time to get your joy back. Time to get your boldness back. Time to get your healing back. Time to get your faith back. Time to get your finances back. Time to get your anointing back. Time to get your power back. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. Who are the dreamers in the room? Say, I have a dream, man. I got a dream. I, I close with this. I posted a couple of weeks ago on social media. If money were no option, what would you do? I did that intentionally because I knew something was coming. The Lord was working in me at this message. If you had, if money were no option, what would you do with your life? Because if I get that answer, I can tap into the dream God's given you. If money were no option, 
what would you do in your life? There's the dream God's given you. What problems would you solve? People immediately started saying, I'd start an orphanage. I, I, I'd, go to the, I'd go to the government and I, would, and I would correct some things here that I don't, I don't agree with. And good. Do it. What's stopping you? Oh, no money. I, I, don't, I don't have enough knowledge. There's schools out there for you, but it costs money. Find money. There's money everywhere. Just because you don't have it yet doesn't mean it's not there. Just because you're sick doesn't mean God stopped healing people. Just because God's not moving in your church doesn't mean God's not moving. You just need somebody to get alongside you so that dream could jump again. I want to help cause that thing to jump on the inside of you again. Matter of fact, business owner, you, you've never started a business, but you really feel compelled to start a business. Where are you? Come here. Come here. It's going to take boldness. Business owners, come here. Woo. I think there's an, I know. I know there's an anointing in the room for business owners. Business owners. That's why it dried up. That's why the Lord transitioned you here. What, what state are you from? Pennsylvania. God, why are you sending me to Georgia? Business owners? <laughs> why are you sending me to Dawsonville, Georgia? What in the world is going on in Cumming, wherever you live? Why are you sending me to the church in Dawsonville? Destination. Dream. Determination. Discipline. It's going to require discipline. It's more than just knowing about cars. It's knowing about business. It's knowing about the Father's business. God will make you great among men if you'll make Him great within. Write that down for me, Father. God will make you great among men if you'll make Him great within. Nobody else sees you on your face. Nobody else sees you on your knees crying out to God. There's one more that says, man, I should have moved. Come on. Give you time. You know who it is? Come on. Where are you? I thought so. Come on. Don't you love it how the Lord knows exactly what to do and when to do it? I knew there was one more. Business owner. Business owner. So proud of Chase Ray, our high school youth pastor, that stepped out into the unknown. God is blessing their business like nobody's business for the glory of God. He's looking for somebody to be available. Business owner, my goodness gracious, lift your hands. <laughs> this is the place. Now is the time. And you are the one. I've given you the dream, says the Lord. This is the way. Walk in. No more delay. No more discouragement. No more distractions. I've told you, I've anointed you, I've marked you. Step out into the unknown. Watch what I'll do. Somebody's had a dream to have a child. You and your husband, you and your, you and your wife have been praying and asking God for a child, and it hasn't come to pass yet. There's an anointing here for that dream. Where are you? Anybody? tell you, Brittany, it shall come to pass. Though it tarry, though it be delayed, it shall come to pass. We laid our hands on this precious couple in Columbus, Ohio. 2009, 2010. Been believing God for years and years to have a child. Nothing. The doctors told that couple the same thing they told me and my wife. You should probably consider adoption, which is amazing. Adoption is amazing. Pursue that. We just knew that on the inside of us, we believed that God called us to go forth and multiply. We wanted our, we wanted our babies. We wanted, we wanted our Madison and Carson. God blessed us. When the doctor said there's no way, Brittany, you and Joe, when the doctor said there's no way, the Lord says Yahweh. 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 
Oh, if we could have a prayer partner behind each one of these, you know how we do it, male with male, female with female, all of our altar workers, leadership, I know a lot are out of town, we just want to come and just want to lay our hands on them and just pray over them, speak the word of the living God, that that dream on the inside of them would come to pass, would come to fruition, and the destination, we need one more right here, we need one more man right here. Altar workers, come on. Right here. It shall come to pass. It shall spring forth suddenly. Oh, for the suddenlies of God. I've got a dream. Anybody else in the room that's got a dream, just throw your hand up. We can't call out all of them, but throw your hand up. I've got a dream. I want to do some great things for God. I feel like it's my time. It is your time. It is your time. All you got to do is go forward, lift him up, and stretch yourself. Stretch yourself. Go forward, lift up, stretch out. This is the will of the Lord. Every dreamer in the building, lift your hand. God, I know. I know you're not through with us yet. You've still got dreams and visions for our lives. Lord, you said in the last days, Joel 2, 28, you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters, they would prophesy. And your old men would dream dreams. Woo, there's some, there's some older men in the room. You think God's forgotten about you. That dream he's given you is done and it's dead. It's not dead and it's not done, it's just dormant. God wants to resurrect that seed on the inside of you, man. The old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. And on my maid servants and men servants, I will pour out my spirit. All the dreamers in the room, lift your hands. If you still got a dream to do something great for God, I don't care if it's going on a missions trip. I don't care if it's planting, you know, a church. I don't care if it's a, an orphanage or, or, or starting some kind of nonprofit. Whatever it is, lift your hands. Say, Jesus, here I am. Come on, Jesus, here I am. Stir up that gift on the inside of me. Fan that flame of the dream on the inside of me. Let me leap. Let it leap on the inside of me, God. For your glory. For your glory. For your glory. We give you praise and honor today. In Jesus' mighty name. Well, come on. If you've been blessed by being in the house of God, won't you put your hands together for the King of Kings, He is here. We want to invite you back out tonight for week 88 of the North Georgia Revival, Pastor David Edmondson. But before you leave, if you're a first-time guest, anybody from out of the country, wave your hand. Out of the country, anybody. Anybody. They'll be here tonight. Anybody today? Anybody out of state that's here this morning from out of state? One here, a couple over there. Wow, so glad to have you. If you would, step out those doors. Turn to the right. The first door on your right over there is our guest reception room. My wife, Paula, and I would love to meet you and greet you, give you a gift there for you. Thank you for being in the house of God today here at Christ Fellowship Church. I got a song that